everyone uh, thanks for coming out uh, for F. Scott Fitzgerald um, I don't know if he'd even appreciate you coming here uh, but you know he will we'll give him some love tonight just a little bit uh, because that's all he ever got anyway uh, but he was brilliant of course what we're doing here is using some um, writers to to interpret the city of angels our city our adopted hometown or at least mine um, and it's an uninterpretable city which means that we want to interpret it all the more and so like the city the meanings of the city just kind of expand and continue to roll and uh, there's there's no real center uh, and yet that that's what I think makes it so interesting is that there's no one Los Angeles there are many Los Angeles and um, and here are a few in this series so we began with Helen Hunt Jackson's Ramona which began as a, was written as a protest novel for, uh, of the treatment of Southern California native people and ends up being a booster novel that gets people to move here from Iowa um, classic LA story you go this way and it ends up you end up over here uh, and then we we talked about Aldous Huxley uh, and James M. Cain and tonight I'm happy to um, to talk about F. Scott Fitz, Fitzgerald's um, vision of Los Angeles which was pretty much Hollywood um, there's not a lot of Los Angeles he saw or wrote about he may have experienced it he didn't write much about it if he did he was in Hollywood and he wasn't especially happy about it at the same time um, it formed him in unique ways and it formed his writings in unique ways and that's what we'll talk about tonight so there he is quite a handsome man 1896 to 1940 he, his kind of alter ego was Ernest Hemingway. Uh, and they couldn't be more different. That's why it's an alter ego. Scott was, um, was imbued with a sense of failure right from the beginning. That's, those aren't my words. They're his. Um, whereas Hemingway was a quite different persona, at least projected to the world. I think it was his actual persona. You know the huntsman, the gamesman, the soldier, the the brawler, the big man. Um, Fitzgerald wrote in his notebooks this: "I talk with the authority of failure. Ernest, my friend Ernest Hemingway, with the authority of success. Um, he was the son of a unsuccessful businessman. F. Scott was." who had to rely upon his wife's inheritance to support his children and this was in St. Paul, Minnesota initially um, they, in, they moved around, he worked for Procter & Gamble his father did, so they moved around some um, it was his wife who had the money and that they really survived on and uh, so that seemed to imprint Scott uh, early on, this sense of his family's outsider status even though they were kind of inside and you'll see this play out in Hollywood perfectly because Hollywood is that writ large you're you're never well you're not never but it's hard to be inside Hollywood even when you're in Hollywood if you know what I mean um, he flunks out of Princeton in 1917 um, and that's an interesting date right so near the end of the Great War uh, so he joins the army and um, serves under Dwight D. Eisenhower whom he hated um, I read a little story called I didn't get over and says he was the army's worst aide-de-camp <laughs> so uh, this you can sense it already this sense of self deference the sense of you know I'm no good but I'm um, but I want to reach for this thing that permeates his whole life it would be uh, 
it's hard to talk about F. Scott Fitzgerald without the women in his life. They were so important, so formative for him. Um, and this is one that I'll talk about less. She's my favorite uh, woman of F. Scott's life, and I'll tell you about her in a minute if you don't already know. So right from the beginning, he had two sisters who died just months before his birth. Um, so that must again have imprinted him. Uh, and then um, he, he was known to court debutantes. So there it is again. His family is not as well off, but they're in this enclave of St. Paul and, and he, uh, he's always reaching for women and other things that are just out of his re reach, like Ginevra King. Um, so she was a debutante from Chicago, and they had a two-year romance. Uh, this is, yeah, 1915. Mostly through letters, which I think is interesting. Um, and um, she, I, I don't know about this stuff, it's kind of interesting. Um, she was maybe the inspiration for Daisy Buchanan. Um, in 1917, the relationship ends. Fitzgerald kept the letters that she had written him, through which they had conducted most of their romance. And after his death, his daughter sent them to Ginevra, who kept them and never showed them to anyone. Would have been interesting to see, but, you know, kind of classy move to keep it private. Oh, right, I forgot about Ginevra. Uh, at 19, he was dating Ginevra, uh, and he older, overheard a family member of hers, we're not sure who it was, but he overheard someone say uh, about him that poor boys should not think of marrying rich girls. There was Lois Moran, um, where uh, Fitzgerald moves to Hollywood in 1926, but it doesn't last very long um, because he has a f an affair with this woman and they had to move back to New York. Now, I haven't mentioned, there's a woman I'm not mentioning, and I think you know why, because <laughs> she, she deserves a couple slides on her own. So he was married, but he had an affair with Lois Moran. There was Sheila Graham, so um, Scott is away from his wife Zelda and um, he's living now in Hollywood in 1937 uh, and he would die here in Hollywood. Uh, and he had a very high profile, profile affair with uh, Sheila Graham um, who was a gossip columnist. Can you imagine? having an affair with a gossip columnist in 1937 Hollywood. Um, he, this is, we'll come to this, but he writes a bunch of short stories about a Hollywood writer uh, during this time. And of course he's sick. He's an alcoholic and he has tuberculosis, uh, or so he said. But there was one woman, Frances Kroll Ring, pictured here who was his personal secretary and maybe, maybe the best woman in his life in some ways. And um, I mean that simply because, well, probably because they weren't in love, <laughs> first of all. So she had some room to be nice to him. Apparently he made a pass at her once and she just went like that. She just swatted it away, you know, which I don't think he was used to. Personal secretary to F. Scott Fitzgerald for the last 20 months of his life. Really interesting woman. She got the job by going to an employment agency, I think in Santa Monica, and they said, oh, there's this writer up there. You know, you could do stuff for him. Um, she wrote her own memoir about this experience called Against the Current, and Fitzgerald fans will recognize that phrase. As I remember F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, so this was in the spring of 1939. She was in her early 20s. Just moved to Los Angeles from the Bronx. Uh, and she ends up being F. Scott Fitzgerald's secretary. She says this, he was only in his 40s, but he was fragile. The kind you wanted to help. He had pale, very pale, 
and very blue eyes, and he was a charmer. He said he was looking for a, Fitzgerald said he was looking for a secretary with no ties to the studios because he was planning a novel about Hollywood and he needed someone who wouldn't gossip to anyone while he was living with Sheila Gray. Um, she writes this, I have a dark impression that lingers of F. Scott Fitzgerald, of a walk we took up the street at one day's end. I was going to my car and he was going to the Schwab's drugstore on Sunset, just a couple blocks away. He was wearing a dark top coat and a gray Hamburg hat. As we kept pace, I looked over him, over at him and was chilled by his image. Like a shadowy figure in an old photograph, his outfit and pallor were alien to the style and warmth of Southern California, as if he were not at home here, had just stopped off and was dressed to leave on the next train. That's her writing, <laughs> which is excellent. And I think she has a great uh, face there and looks really happy. She died at 99. But then, <laughs> If you wanted the opposite, <laughs> Francis Kroll Ring, you would do no better than to go to Zelda Zare. There are her dates, 1900 to 1948. She's an Alabama woman. Uh, in fact, a pretty prominent one. So again, he's, he's like dating and eventually marrying out of his station. I don't want to say his class because it wasn't that hard, that distinct a difference, but it was, as Ginevra said, f for anyone below this class, everybody's poor, right? S Scott wasn't poor, but his family wasn't, but he was not up there. Uh, so she's the youngest child of an Alabama Supreme Court justice um, and prominent middle class roots in Montgomery, Alabama, and in Confederate history. Her father's uncle, uh, lent his house to Jefferson Davis for the first White House of the Confederacy. Um, yeah, she was named after a gypsy heroine. I didn't know this till I did this research. She was named after a gypsy heroine from an 1874 novel. And if any of you have played The Legend of Zelda, that's who she's named for. That's who the game character is named for, of course. Um, let's see. She meets Scott in July 18, uh, July 1918, just after graduating from Sydney, Sydney Linear uh, High School. Uh, he was 21, still in, in the Army at that time, uh, in a nearby Camp Sheridan in Alabama, Montgomery. Uh, he told her he was on the verge of literary fame, and she said, I'll wait and see. I have other suitors, <laughs> which she did. Um, he continued to press her to become engaged, and of course this drove him crazy, and he's already coming to this relationship with this sense of inferiority and class uh, problems, and so she says no, she, she does not marry him. Um, until the publication of This Side of Paradise, his first novel. Ah, she says, I see you really did this now. So yes, you may marry me. Which they did, April 3rd, 1920. Um, the character, you'll see this throughout Fitzgerald's writings. It's so much of it is thinly veiled autobiography. So the character in this side of paradise is uh, Rosalind Connage, and pretty much everybody said, oh, that's Zelda. Um, and so Zelda became a celebrity because of this novel. And we saw this with Ramona, how people came and drove to Los Angeles to see the sights of Ramona, which is fiction. But then, you know, I go downtown, I'm like, oh, there's where they shot that heat, that scene in heat, that, that big gun, gun battle. It, yeah, well, what is that? That's nothing. It's a movie, but you know, it, there it is right there. 
Same thing, Zelda becomes famous because of Scott's character, Rosalind, in This Side of Paradise. Um, her reaction, to, we'll see this again, they kind of steal from each other all the time, Scott and Zelda in their writing. So apparently, at the birth of their daughter, Scotty, uh, Zelda is purported to have said, I'm glad it's a girl and I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in the, this world, a beautiful little fool. And fans of The Great Gatsby will recognize that line as Daisy's line to her daughter. So the line between these things are, are very thin. She was all along really both a, an inspiration and a collaborator with Scott on his work. Um, hard to overestimate her influence. Um, the Beautiful and the Damned, uh, one of his novels was published and <laughs> the New York Tribune hired Zelda to review the novel. Um, and then she got into a fight with Scott because upon reviewing the novel she saw that there was a passage from her diary in it. <laughs> this was their relationship, it's awesome. Um, there are some critics who say that Zelda co-authored much of Fitzgerald's writing. I don't think that's true, but certainly she had a commanding influence on his life and writing. So, by the late 20s, the Jazz Age, um, they become the celebrity of New York, especially. Um, Zelda wanted to be her own person, wanted her own creative outlets, and she was a dancer and very interested in art and dance. Two of her great childhood passions that she continued into her adult life. In 1930, she begins to have the first of what would be many breakdowns. Um, stress, possibly uh, precipitated by her frustrated attempts at being a ballerina, who knows? Um, and who knows what the diagnosis was? Much of it looks like what we would call schizophrenia, um, but mental health experts later contest this diagnosis. Um, from June uh, 1930 to, um, let's see, September 1931, Zelda lived in Neon, Switzerland in a sanitarium. And after her release, she and the couple uh, she and F Scott returned to a rented home in Old Cloverdale in Montgomery, which is now the home of the F. Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald Museum. I used to teach right down the street. I walked past it many times. Um, she wrote her own book um, in 1932. Uh, she entered a clinic in, uh, at Johns Hopkins, and then she completed a novel there. <laughs> okay, while she was uh, in a clinic. Save Me the Waltz. What do you think it was about? Their marriage, of course. Uh, he hated this book <laughs> and uh, blamed the financial burden of her hospitalization on the fact that he was having trouble completing Tinder as the Night. Um, and once again, he accuses her of stealing material from him for her Save Me the Waltz book. Um, they parted ways in 1934. They never divorced. Uh, Zelda was in the hospital or away at other places. Uh, Scotty was raised largely by nannies or bo at boarding school. From 1936 to 1940, Zelda was in um, Highland Hospital in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, beautiful place, I grew up near there, uh, just over the mountain. Scott starts descending even more into alcoholism and literary obscurity. Um, she died so horribly. Um, she was one of nine women killed in this hospital that night in March uh, 1948 when a fire swept through the hospital's main wing. 
So two quite tragic lives that found each other but produced some amazing work. So what I'm doing here is rolling, sorry, rolling uh, the works, trying to roll the works, oh, sorry, it's going, the works of F. Scott Fitzgerald. And you may know him, I just want to mark this, because he was known as a writer of the lost generation. So this is how I became friends with Hemingway and other expatriate Americans in uh, France. Um, the lost generation, uh, resulting from the effects of the Great War, World War I. This is a really interesting time in, Amer in uh, world history. Um, and um, it, it kind of interests me that we don't talk about it more. It was the most horrific war in existence. Um, so many people died, I think nine million. More people died in World War II, but the way they died in World War I was just horrific. Uh, chemical weapons, nerve gas, mustard gas, trench warfare that was just unimaginably horrible. It produces um, uh, some amazing, tragic, elegiac British poetry, for example, the Great War, and it affected the lost generation of um, Scott and Ernest Hemingway and others. What, what defines this lost generation? Decadence. So, as you'll see, if you don't already know from Fitzgerald's work, there's a sense of just, you know, let's just party. Nothing means anything. Let's just, you know, push on through to a morning with this bottle of gin. By the way, when Francis Scott, uh, Francis Kroll Ring goes to Scott's house for the first time, he asks her to get something out of a drawer and she pulls it open and there's like 10 gin, empty gin bottles in the drawer. So she kind of knew what she was getting into. Uh, decadence, gender roles and impotence. So if you know Hemingway's, my favorite book of Hemingway's, The Sun Also Rises, you know that the main character is impotent and he's been made so by the war. Well, that's, that's literal in terms of the character, but is also, of course, metaphorical because the men of that generation, um, all quiet on the Western Front is the same sense of things, made impotent by war. An idealized past, right? Um, the, the best example is Gatsby, of course, and we'll get to that. So this idealized past, this despair of the present, this loss of a story for men, especially, um, because men had a story. It was the story of honor and war. But World War I just wrecked that. And in fact, after World War I is usually seen the birth of modernism <clears throat> in literature, where instead of writers trying to kind of describe reality, they turn inward and try to describe that reality. And so you get Virginia Woolf with stream of consciousness writing and such like that. Here are some works of note. This Side of Paradise, his first novel, as I mentioned. Short, uh, let me see, let me give you some more information on that. So, um, again, remember, this is thinly veiled autobiography. You could argue that every novel's autobiography and sure, you can make that argument, but it's really prevalent in Fitzgerald. Main character protagonist is Amory Blaine. Um, his, uh, he's depicted in, caught in between this generational dilemma, which is another feature of Fitzgerald's writing. He fails often in love and in college with institutions, as Fitzgerald did. Um, and, and these, while these are arguably so painful, not arguably, they are so painful to the character, you could argue that these are also metaphors for the changes in culture. Um, and I think you would be right if you did that. So it's not just about personal failings, it's about the failings of culture. A culture that would produce a great war, for example. Uh, so for example, there's a line here, um, about growing up to discover all the gods dead, all the wars fought, fought, all the faiths shaken. 
there it is. And that's Fitzgerald's genius right there. This would become the template, the site of paradise, 1920. You can draw a line from there to Catcher in the Rye and the Bell Jar. These anti-hero, anti, you know, the Bildungsroman is, a, is a, supposed to be a novel of coming of age, right, until you come into your adulthood and you figure things out. And things aren't perfect, but you, you kind of got it. This is not that. You don't get it in Fitzgerald, um, just as you don't in Catcher in the Rye, etc. cetera. Um, the short stories, Saturday Evening Post, like I said, this is where he created the image of the flapper and um, bobbed hair, knee-bearing skirts, knee-bearing skirts, uh, coquettish the women are. Um, this is Rosalind Connage. This is Zelda, frankly. Uh, other characters. Um, well, I love this. Um, female readers were presented in these short stories of the flappers and such with a self-conscious, rebellious identity that freed them from the structures of Victorian society. So that's one of the things that happens when there are structural changes in a culture or in a society is it's devastating, it's even traumatic, but it also shakes loose new beginnings. I don't know if that has anything to do with 2019, but, you know, maybe. Um, <clears throat> the diamond as big as the Ritz. Ritz. Um, he, he, he didn't want to be known as a flapper writer solely, although that stuff is awesome. Uh, so he tried to reach beyond this general uh, generational focus to address some of these sweeping cultural changes. And so money, not surprisingly, was one of his um, targets. And this is the, the diamond as big as the rich, Ritz. <laughs> Freudian slip there. This is about uh, a man who's the world's richest man. He lives on a mountain-sized diamond in the Montana Rockies. Um, 1922, interesting timing. Uh, his name is Braddock Washington and his net worth is far from stable because he's got this problem. He's got this diamond as big as a mountain or as big as the Ritz. And it's so large that if it were offered for sale, it would wreck the market. The market would crash. And if the value should vary, there would not be en enough gold in the world, because it was gold standard, to buy one-tenth. So he's too rich. He's too rich to enjoy it. Classic Fitzgerald conundrum, right? Um, and so he just lives on this mountain in Montana and has to threaten to kill people who come and try to get some of this worthless, ultimately worthless diamond. Uh, let's see, the beautiful and the damned. Um, <laughs> sometimes, yes, he likes to moralize rather than satirize. He's a brilliant satirist, as we'll see at the end. Um, the beautiful and the damned is about the decay of an upper-class family in New York um, as they await an inheritance. And it's brilliant conceit here. They're sitting around waiting for their inheritance, which is substantial. So they don't do anything. They're just waiting for the check to come. And so they begin to turn on each other and turn on themselves. They fall into alcoholism um, and, and just an incredible tragedy um, because they're waiting. They're just waiting to get what they think they want. Um, really interesting novel. Babylon Revisited. Well, let me, let me go through and get, some, get to some of the major works because that's what you want to do. I know. So, Gatsby. Um, I think you know this, but basically, let me, let me rehearse it just in case you forgot from when you read it in high school or college. So there's the narrator, who's Nick Carraway, an ambitious um, 
upstart, not upstart, that's too strong. He, he just wants to make some money. He's new to New York and to the game. And he wants to make some money in finance. Um, early 20s, right? <laughs> you can see it coming, the Great Depression. Um, he discovers that his home is right next door to a man named Jay Gatsby, who throws the best parties ever. And across an narrow bay from Tom and Daisy Buchanan. Um, so one evening after returning from visiting Tom and Daisy, Nick uh, sees Gatsby staring across the bay at the Buchanan's home. And what's he staring at? The green light, right? Turns out, as things develop, that Gatsby and Daisy had a relationship several years prior. Um, and uh, Gatsby is out to win her back. So this idealized past, right, of the lost generation. It also turns out that Gatsby's real name is James Gatz, and that he had to create this new identity for himself because he got into some trouble before. Um, Gatsby and Daisy reunite. They re-fall in love. They decide uh, Daisy decides to make this clear to Tom for some reason, um, who is shocked, but not too much. Um, there is a, a drive to New York where Tom confronts Gatsby. Coming back, they accident, accidentally kill a woman whose husband, uh, Myrtle Wilson, sorry, uh, whose husband comes and kills Gatsby. Uh, and then kills himself. So what is this about? Um, by the way, the, the novel ends with Nick just going home to the Midwest. Uh, he has had enough of New York. He has had enough of the jazz age. And he has uh, had enough of living the high life. So this is, there's a, I think this is from the Fitzgerald Society webpage, which is really good, really good material on Fitzgerald. And the writer there says that um, this, the Gatsby novel is about the dual perspective or double vision, and I like this a lot. He, his work, Fitzgerald's work, does not merely sermonize against easy money and irrational exuberance. That's easy. That's like didactic fiction. Don't do this, right? Look what the bad things that happen um, when you do this. Instead, he makes the, the characters appealing. You kind of want to hang out at one of Gatsby's parties. You kind of just want to be there. Um, and you kind of understand Tom and Daisy and Nick. Uh, so they're not distant, right? They're, in fact, they're extremely close. Uh, Malcolm Cowley calls this a maximum of immersion. So the reader is immersed in Fitzgerald's worlds with a maximum of critical attachment. And so the deeper you go in, the more critical you become of the scene. Well, where are you supposed to go, right? <laughs> Where's, where are the characters supposed to go? It's the deeper you go, the more critical you come, become, the more you see through it, you're stuck. Might as well go back home to Iowa, which is what, or Chicago, I forget where Nick is from. This is, of course, Fitzgerald's crowning achievement. Imagistic, dreamlike, profoundly sad, the novel contains several of the most evocative symbols in all of American literature. The green light at the end of Daisy's Dock that Gatsby stares out across the water at every night. The Valley of Ashes that separates Long Island from New York City. Incredible scenes of the drive from Long Island to New York City and the eyes, the optometrist's eyes on the billboard. Um, oh, that's the next line. Uh, the eyes on the billboard. The plot, moreover, asks us to read the novel on different thematic levels. It's a love story. Uh, Gatsby explores the limits of self-making, so it's a kind of uh, coming of age or coming into one's own novel. The delusions of materialism. One critic said uh, Fitzgerald was a failed Marxist novelist. Um, meaning, well, <laughs> the intangibility of aspiration, 
uh, in a supposedly classless society. Um, and then Gatsby's ambition is elegized in an, as an expression of the American dream. Um, here's a line, some lines from the novel. Oh, no, this is the main, sorry, this is the main one. So let me give you the full context of that famous quote. Here it is. And it, as I sat there brooding on the old, unknown world, I thought of Gatsby's wonder when he first picked out the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. He had come a long way to this blue lawn, and his dream must have seemed so close that he could hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him. Somewhere back in that vast obscurity beyond the city, the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under night. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us, <laughs> recedes before us. We can't quite get there. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow, we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther, and one fine morning, dash. So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Tender is the Night, 1934. This is Rosemary who meets Dr. Dick Diver and his wife Nicole on the French Riviera, as one does. She falls in, she's 17. She falls in love with Dick. After spending some time there, um, she leaves her mother and travels with them to Paris. And here she shopped with Nicole, uh, Dr. Diver's wife, had fun. Of course, Dick starts to fall in love with her and they all celebrate her 18th birthday. You can feel it coming, right? You can just feel it coming just with that description. Something horrible is gonna happen and it does. There's a death, Nicole freaks out. Um, She's rocking herself on the bathroom floor. She can't speak. This is obviously Zelda, of course. She's holding the bloody sheets from the death, and um, she drifted back into insanity. Rosemary goes home to her mother. They go to Zurich. Um, Nicole, um, Rosemary and Dick get back together. Uh, her sister says, no, you're just marrying him for his money, etc. Um, Dick starts to drink, no connection to F. Scott Fitzgerald. He starts falling in love with every girl he sees, no connection at all. During this time, his father died, so he goes to America. Here he sees Rosemary again. He hadn't seen her in four years. They flirted some more, they go to bed, and afterwards they realize they're not in love at all. <laughs> love that story right after four years you've had this whole journey so many things have, oh it's you and they do the dance they flirt they have sex oh uh, yeah this no this isn't it don't want this <laughs> classic Fitzgerald um, again uh, the Fitzgerald Society which is housed in Alabama by the way uh, says this, tender is the night is the opposite of Gatsby in almost every imaginable way. Written over the course of, tempe of a tempestuous nine-year period when he himself was handicapped by alcoholism and Zelda was descending into mental illness. The book is chaotic, non-chronological, and fraught with ruminations and rhetorical sideshows that expound upon the historical, cultural, and philosophical import of its actions. Sorry, this is from his biography, Life and Letters. So on one level, um, the book refutes the great man theory of historical progressivism. So what he's talking about here, the critic is talking about here is up until World War I, there was this sense of the zenith of human achievement having been reached. That's always a good idea, 
to think that you have, there's nothing more for you to learn or do. But that was it. So you began with modernism in the 16th and 17th centuries with advancements in science, Isaac Newton, uh, Francis Bacon, Th Thomas Hobbes even with his theory of the state based on uh, observation and scientific principles, if not science itself. You go from there and then, you know what, 300 years later, we got this. We got this. A and all the things that come along with that. So, you, so now you become interested in primitive cultures, right? Oh, let's see how far we've come. Look at those poor people, right? Oh my God, what must it be to live like that? Oh my, what, and all the while the implication is, here we are. Are we not awesome? And then what happens in 1914? We begin the stupidest war ever. Because it happens because Franz Ferdinand's, Ferdinand's nephew gets shot by some doofus and there are all these treaties and agreements in place and suddenly it's a world war. It's stupid. And then the war itself is horrific. And so the great man theory of historical pro progressivism was left somewhere in a trench in Germany because it was no more. And Fitzgerald was there. He was in that war. In fact, he wanted to do something in the war, but the war ended <laughs> before he got to do anything. So he can't even you know, act out this war persona, this soldier persona that he wanted to do. Uh, wanted to have it and so what results from the Great War is is a sense of lostness like I mentioned with the lost generation um, Americans living in Paris now instead of America this sense of borderless almost a borderless Europe now after the war and um, and of course you know the Treaty of Versailles was signed there and that leads to World War II by the way uh, it was a terrible time here's some lines from Tinders the Night that give you a sense of Fitzgerald's voice and of the novel often people display it I love this line often people display a curious respect for a man drunk respect rather than fear there's something awe-inspiring in one who has lost all inhibitions will do anything. Of course, we make him pay afterward for his moment of superiority, his moment of impressiveness. I don't ask you to love me always like this, but I ask you to remember somewhere inside of me, there will always be the person I am tonight. Right? Isn't that great? So you've got both these lines in the same novel, this utter despair of, um, not despair, but other, this kind of distanced observation of a man drunk and how we're going to punish him for his freedom from his inhibitions. And yet this beautiful line, I recognize that love, our love's not going to last. I just want you to remember that I am this person this night and that person will always be inside of me. Just incredible poignancy and beauty along with satire. And then there's the love of the last tycoon, or it usually gets printed as the last tycoon. Um, uh, I don't want to get into all the plot, but um, it's the life of uh, Hollywood manager Monroe Starr. Uh, and again, thinly veiled based on Irving Thalberg who was the head of MGM, and I think he was at Universal before that. He knew him, Fitzgerald knew him during his time in Hollywood. Um, yeah, it's, it's a Hollywood story uh, with these characters in it. It's just de more decadence and more lostness with the Hollywood angle, I'm gonna put it that way. Uh, <laughs> for example, one of the major scenes is uh, Cecilia is a, a young woman, again, and she's, let's see, she's, uh, her father is um, Pat Brady, an influential Hollywood producer. She's flying home to Los Angeles from New York, and, and they have to stop in Nashville, Tennessee. It's 
really weird. Um, and so they can't go on, so they stop to, they go out to see the home of Andrew Jackson, the Hermitage, it's called, I've been there. Andrew Jackson was one of the worst presidents ever. He was horrible. And so they stop and see this for some reason. And um, again, I don't want to get too wrapped up in the plot here. You can read it for yourself. But she meets uh, a man named Mr. Schwartz, who ends up committing suicide in Nashville before they leave, but gives her a message, gives Cecilia a message uh, to give to her father's business partner, Monroe Starr. Now, Cecilia has had a crush on Monroe for a long time, and um, she, she goes to her father, Pat's film studio, to pick him up for a birthday party, and this I love. There was an earthquake, and they all end up in Starr's office. Okay, nice plot device, Scott. Then a water pipe bursts, and it floods the set. Star sees two women desperately clinging to the head of a statue floating by and finding one of them to be the splitting image of his late wife. What? This is like out of uh, Day of the Locust or something. The day after, Star asks his secretary to identify the girls for him. She gets their phone numbers, which he immediately uses to hook up with them. But it's not the girl he thought he saw. It doesn't resemble his wife at all. Um, but Star is disappointed. Star gives her a ride home where she insists that he'd come in and meet her friend. Guess who that is? That's the girl, the woman he was looking for. And it goes on and on, as you might imagine. Um, now, this was his last novel. It was unfinished. His friend Edmund Wilson, uh, the critic, finished it for him. Matthew Bricoli, who is the foremost Fitzgerald scholar, calls it the most promising and most disappointing fragment in American fiction, The Last Tycoon, which is uh, on Amazon now, isn't it? With Kelsey Grammer, I think. Um, this, this is what he was working on at the time of his death. Um, and it is a satire, I guess, parody of Hollywood in many ways. Let me give you some lines from it so you can get a sense of, um, and you may recognize some of these. Writers aren't people exactly, or if they're any good, they're a whole lot of people trying to, so hard to be one person. It's like actors who try so pathetically not to look into mirrors, who lean backward trying only to see their faces in the reflecting chandeliers. You should have risen above it, I said smugly. It's not a slam at you when people are rude, it's a slam at the people they've met before. Isn't that genius? When people are rude to you and you don't know them, they're not talking to you. They're talking to the people they've met before that they're connecting to you. I like that a lot. Really, his most devastating attack on Hollywood was the short stories called the Pat Hobby Stories. January 1940, the last year of his life, basically, through May 1941. Uh, let me give you some, um, some lines from these stories. That Pat Hobby is a, uh, is a Hollywood writer. He's the writer that Fitzgerald never was. All right, so he's, he's an alter ego. He's a guy who just writes to make money in Hollywood. So you probably know this guy. Um, Fitzgerald says this, as long past as 1930, I had a hunch that the talkies would make even the best selling novelists archaic, as archaic as silent pictures. People still read, but there was a rankling indignity that to me had become almost an obsession in seeing the power of the written word subordinated to another power, a more glittering, grosser power. He's a novelist. He, he writes sentences, not scenes. 
Pat Hobby, <laughs> the character, was described as a homunculus mm -hmm. hatched out of a seething medium of bile and bad checks. <laughs> <laughs> During his many adventures in the Pat Hobby stories, Pat, among other things, unintentionally impersonates Orson Welles, poses nude for a studio honcho's friend, has a tete-a-tete -tete with the President of the United States, bashes a more successful writer over the head with a lunch tray, and tries to become a producer by cobbling together a shooting team that includes a German starlet whose only phrases of English are, how do you do, I think it's wonderful, and I must go now. <laughs> the only thing Pat Hobby pretty much never does in the course of all these stories is actually write. And this is a flaw or perhaps a virtue that manages to depict Fitzgerald's view so beautifully and painfully of a Hollywood writer's life and a real writer's, real writer's self-loathing. And that is Fitzgerald in Hollywood. Some lines from the Pat Hobby stories. I've got more screen credits than a dog has got fleas. I've teamed up with some man who wrote dialogue. And this happened to Fitzgerald. Um, when he came to Hollywood and started writing screenplays, he would write out these Fitzgerald-esque scenes, focusing on sentences, focusing on words, and, and then some writer, screenwriter, would come along and just rip it. And, and in fact, they put him behind. They put him reporting to some of these pat hobby types. And he just couldn't deal with it. Uh, it drove him in, insane. He, he actually wrote, he, wrote, he worked on, I don't think he has a screen credit for it, but he worked on Gone with the Wind. But they told him he couldn't change a single word of Margaret Mitchell's novel. Okay, Shh, okay, so what am I doing here? <laughs> Why don't you just use the novel? That was his life. Um, Yes, um, Pat at one point tells an enterprising young writer, says, look, um, have you read a book? And they're like, well, yeah, I've read a book. He's like, just take five things that stuck in your mind from that book, and that's a movie. <laughs> Pat Hobby, awesome. So, what was F. Scott Fitzgerald's Los Angeles? It was a dark, hopeful place. Hope, human hope and wild desire, right? That was his experience here. He moves here in 1937. His good friend, um, Thomas Wolfe, Lacombe Angel, that guy, uh, writes him, Dear Scott, I don't know where, you're, where you are living right now, but I'll be damned if I believe anyone lives in a place called the Garden of Allah. <laughs> but he did. He did. That was an apartment complex on Sunset, I think. Part of, um, part of his problem, <laughs> I mean, there's so many problems he had in Hollywood, but one of them was Irving Thalberg. The Last Tycoon, right? Um, the guy who ran Universal City at 22, and then four years later at 26, he's running MGM. And Thalberg uh, apparently was the guy who, who just said screenwriting should be like a model Ford factory. You just, you know, you just put, put pieces together, have individuals putting pieces together. And that drove Fitzgerald insane, of course, because he has this amazing vision, these grand sweeps of, of despair and hope and, and plot and sentences. Um, th this just drove him crazy. Um, Jack Warner called such writers as Fitzgerald and uh, Faulkner 
and <laughs> uh, many writers, many novelists come here to do screenwriting and it rarely goes well. Jack Warner said they were smucks, schmucks with Underwoods. Now for you kids, an Underwood is a typewriter. For you kids, a typewriter is a <laughs> mechanism for typing words. Just, you can look it up. Billy Wilder, oh, I love this line. Billy Wilder, the great director, really liked Scott Fitzgerald and likened him to, quote, a great sculptor who's hired to do a plumbing job <laughs> with no idea of how to connect the pipes or make the water flow. That is perfect, absolutely perfect. Scott said, I hate the place. I hate Hollywood like a poison with a sincere hatred. And yet, he was absolutely desperate to work here. I don't know if anybody can, <laughs> uh, can relate to this feeling of wanting to be here so badly and then hating what you see and how it treats you. He's writing, he's coming back to Hollywood in 1937 and he's writing to Scotty his daughter on the train and, and it just pains me to hear this because we know this brilliant mind, this graceful pen, this devastating wordsmith and this is what he says, I, I must be very tactful with the Hollywood people. I must be very tactful and keep my hand on the wheel. I must find out the key man among the bosses, the most malleable among the collaborators and, and given a break I can make them double this contract that I have. Oh, that just pains me. Here he is again. So that's him on the train. Now he's been here two years. To say I'm disillusioned is putting it mildly. For 19 years, with two years out for sickness, I've written best-selling entertainment, and my dialogue is supposedly right at the top because he does start to work eventually. I'm utterly miserable at seeing months of work and thought negated in one hasty week. Imagine, right? Imagine a writer like Fitzgerald who, who takes so long to turn to, to create this alchemy of his pain into beauty in his writing. And then he comes here and some Pat Hobby kind of guy just goes, Psh, here, I can do that. Here, here's a scene I remember from a book. <laughs> I'll write it down. I'm utterly miserable at seeing months of work and thought negated in one hasty week. I hope you're big enough to take this letter as it's meant. Oh, this is to, uh, this is to Thalberg, I think. I hope you're big enough to take this letter as, it, as it's meant. A desperate plea to restore dialogue to its former quality. Why can't producers ever be wrong? I'm a good writer, honest. Oh, God, poor guy. And, and if, as I said, eventually he kind of just works the, the game and he starts getting successful, uh, in quotation marks. He writes this, I'm now considered a success in Hollywood. He observed Riley. Because something which I did not write is going on under my name. And something which I did write has been quietly bur buried without any fuss or row, not even a squeak from me. The change from regarding this as a potential art to looking it, at it as a cynical business has begun. But I still think and sometime during my stay out here, I will be able to get something of my own out on the screen that I can ask my friends to see. Oh my God, I just want to hug him. Um, and then a final rejection. I mean this because I think Hollywood was his last mistress. I think like nearly every other woman he seduced or wooed or courted he never measured up, and I think Hollywood was the last one. Isn't Hollywood a dump? He wrote to a friend in 1940. In the human sense of the word. <laughs> a hideous town, pointed up by the insulting gardens of its rich, 
full of the human spirit at a new low of debasement. And yet, not much later, he wrote in his notes, I look out at it, Hollywood, and I think it is the most beautiful history in the world. It is the history of me and of my people. It is the history of all aspiration, not just the American dream, but the human dream. And if I came at the end of it, that too is a place in the line of pioneers. Thank you for listening to F. Scott Fitzgerald. <laughs>